Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, as always, and today we are sitting down with incumbent Ward 9 Calgary City Councilor and running for re-election City Councilor, Giancarlo Carra. Giancarlo, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for doing this. I think it's critically important that we are able to talk about the choices that sit before us in our fragile democracy. Well, and I appreciate you taking the time, uh, but I'm going to start off with the same question I've asked every single municipal can, uh, candidate in this election. Where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I'll tell you, for me, I spent a big chunk of my life wandering the earth like Cain, uh, trying to figure out how I could sort of balance uh, doing well with doing good. And I don't know where that sense of, of, of real sort of prioritizing doing good comes from, probably my parents, probably my upbringing. Uh, but it took me a long time to find a way into the world where I could have impact and feel like what I was doing was, was in the service of people. I, I mean, how deep do you want to get into it? As deep as you want to get into, because uh, it's always fascinating from my perspective to hear why people decide politics and serving people in a political realm is the way that they see is best fit for them. So, and that would be my follow-up question is why politics? You could have done nonprofits, you could have volunteered, but you chose politics, why? Well, I'll tell you that uh, my service in politics is part of a larger mission. And it's really a sort of a city building mission. Uh, I've described the mission over the last 11 years as the city councilor as the great neighborhoods mission. And great neighborhoods is based on the very simple but compelling idea that great neighborhoods make a great city. And if you want to get really sort of policy wonky and nerdy about it, let's do it. I think that if the individual is the atom, and if the family, or the business or whatever other social structure you're examining is the molecule, the cell of civilization, the cellular structure of civilization is the neighborhood. So sitting alone on the landscape, the neighborhood is a village. Network with other neighborhoods, uh, the neighborhood forms towns and cities. The organism that is civilization, where civilizations rise and fall is at the regional level. So it's the relationship between villages and towns and cities with each other, with their air shed, their food shed, their watershed, their culture, their commerce. You know, it's like, it's like Wakanda. It's like, you know, whatever you want to say. So, you know, I think as a young person, my first mission, I was, I was very privileged. I was able to sort of pursue the idea of getting educated. You know, I, I, my mom was born in the back of a shop in Inglewood in 1940 to Danish settlers. And they spent, you know, almost a decade working the threshing crews in rural Alberta, uh, harvesting wheat. My grandfather worked the threshing crews. My grandmother cooked for them. And this was not the farmland that was promised to them, uh, you know, in the, in the posters and Copen in downtown Copenhagen. And uh, by, by 1940, four children born on the land, a third, a fifth child in the valley, my mom. The idea was that uh, it was time to become city folks because the dirty thirties and rural Alberta, and, you know, what John Palliser a couple decades before had de deemed the great Canadian waste and the Palliser triangle. It was time to become city folk. And they moved to Calgary and there was a housing shortage. And the only place they could live was in the back of a shop on the proviso that my grandmother opened up a commercial business. And so she ran a dress alteration shop. Right now, much to my chagrin, that shop is shoulder to shoulder military with a right next to the blue store, uh, right off of 13th Street on, on Main Street, 9th Avenue in Blythe Hall. And uh, that, that, that's a very uh, interesting store. Uh, that guy was uh, overtly racist before uh, we, collectively decided that uh, systemic racism was something that we have to address in order to fulfill our promise uh, as Canadians to our, to our commitment to pluralism and diversity. That guy, and, and, and in doing so, obviously, uh, people who want to protect their privilege, people who don't want to, 
people who don't want uh, to change the status quo have gotten very overt in their racism. The guy who runs that store was overt in his racism long before that. Uh, but my mom was born in the back of that shop and uh, she graduated Western Canada High School in 1958. And her dream was to go to university. And that was not even in the cards for a poor East Calgary girl at this, in this city at that point in history. And so she moved to New York City because she had learned that if you worked in Manhattan, the city government was sending its workforce to free night school at the city colleges. And so she moved sight unseen to New York City, got a job as a secretary in a madman-esque ad agency and got her master's in English literature on the dime of the New York government. I basically did the reverse of what she did. I graduated high school in New York City and I came here to experience Calgary uh, in the winter to go to the University of Calgary to experience the mountains that I had spent my youth hiking and camping in, uh, in winter form and to learn to ski. And I really felt like I was coming out to, to the countryside. And uh, I, I discovered that, you know, as I was in class with small town Alberta, small town BC, small town Saskatchewan and Manitoba kids who had come to the big city, that we were looking at this place with very different perspectives, but equally valid perspectives. Anyway, I was able to pursue a history degree because I, you know, I was in a privileged position of middle class. Them. I had uh, the wherewithal to sort of say, before I figure out what I want to do with my life, I want to figure out how the world works. And I gravitated towards history. And then I wandered the earth for quite some time, figuring out like, you know, I worked in food. I worked with youth. I spent some time in the construction industries, building things. I had design skills, both from my, I, I did a, almost did a, mi a minor in art at university. And then I have a high school diploma from uh, LaGuardia High School of Music, Art and the Performing Arts in, in, in New York. So I had this suite of skills that I was developing, but I didn't know exactly how to apply that in the best way possible towards helping people. And uh, I discovered urban design. I was sort of rooting around trying to figure out what to do a master's in. And I took a course in urban design theory at the University of Calgary. And I had my epiphany. I had no idea there was a profession that was focused on combining the physical question of how we live on the landscape together with all of the social and cultural inputs and all of the financial inputs that go into city building. I had no idea that there were such things as planners that for the last hundred years have been slowly trying to methodically divide up the project of human habitat into rational pods of residential and commercial and industrial zones and then figure out how to count cars so we could drive between them. And, and it all made sense. Like my history degree, it turns out, was a, was a history degree on the urbanization of North America. I also studied a lot of uh, you know, indigenous uh, history, and so sort of just understanding who we are and where we are, I discovered we, you know, we're in a challenging moment in history where, uh, where for the last 70 years, we have not built our physical environment according to our ideals. We built our physical environment according to the needs of the automobile. And now we realize that that's a uh, environmental disaster it's a social disaster and for cities, it's a financial disaster because the automobile scaled city just does not pencil out. It's like a Ponzi scheme. You need way more infrastructure than there's tax base to support that structure. And so I had my urban design epiphany and I leapt into professional practice and cities across North America were figuring out, holy smokes, we can't keep on keeping on like this. We have to do things differently. I was lucky enough to be in school with some very talented people. And I was like, wow, these people know what the hell they're doing. They've got great skills. And so I hooked onto them and we, you know, one guy in particular, Jeff Dyer, uh, had a line into some of the top, top practitioners across North America. And so we were able to open up a practice and really be involved in emerging best practice across North America. And while we were doing this out of a small little shop in downtown Calgary, sort of helping cities across North America figure out how to walk the talk of more sustainability and walkable neighborhoods and all of that, 
I had the time and the wherewithal to continue to my studies at the University of Calgary and to volunteer my time to, to local East Calgary communities. So I was the president of the Inglewood Community Association for uh, seven years. I was the redevelopment chair for three years before that. I was engaged in extensive action research through the University of Calgary, my master's degree program, then a uh, collaboration between uh, the, 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 the faculty of social work and the faculty of environmental design called People in Place, really talking about how the physical places we live in and the people and the cultures and, and, and the economies that inhabit them are really in a, in, in a dialogue. And uh, after 10 years of doing that work, I realized that um, Calgary was, was really an exceptional example of the post-war North American city. And it had done things better than most places, but it had also done them better and put itself in, in a more fraught position. Like, you know, city of Calgary has, you know, was one of the lowest population densities in North America. For a city of our size, we have more infrastructural, you know, uh, we have more infrastructural uh, needs and we've built more things to support the, the lifestyle that we live. We have 16,900 lane kilometers of road in the city of Calgary. That's 77 lane kilometers of road per person. That's enough road that if we were to sort of lay a road on just city of Calgary tax base road, and stretch it out across the country, we could drive from City Hall in downtown Calgary to downtown Halifax and back and back to Halifax and back and still have enough road to get out to the mountains to ski. You know, and that is just, and that's just one area where we have overbuilt and we need to do things very differently. And I mean, it's just an absolute necessity. And so, so after I, 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 I'm going to jump in here because I want to make sure yeah, that please I, do. I get, please we got a do. question in here. It's great. You spent 10 years doing that. What was the political itch? What was the political itch that said, you know what, my my voice needs to be on council because a we need to do things differently because 11 years ago, you said you did uh, run in 2010, you were elected. Mm -hmm. So you decided mm -hmm. I need to run. I need to address these issues. And the people of Ward 9 are concerned that these issues aren't being addressed. And I believe I'm the best person to do that. Well, as I said, I had worked extensively with the community. I had worked extensively with the Inglewood Community Association, and I'd worked extensively with the communities of the Greater Forest Lawn. And both of those projects were sort of under the rubric of a design initiative. So we did the International Avenue Design Initiative and we did the Inglewood Design Initiative over, you know, over that decade from about 2003 uh, to, to 2010 when I sought elected office. Uh, the International Avenue Design Initiative really looked at the, the, the communities of Greater Forest Lawn and working with them, it established a two point strategy. One was the Central East Corridor strategy, the idea that from the downtown, the emerging East Village that my partner Jeff Dyer was taking a design lead position on, the Inglewood and Ramsey communities where I was, uh, you know, a community association leader, the communities of Greater Forest Lawn, and then the countryside out to the city of Chestermere. We had a corridor with a tremendous amount of diversity, a tremendous amount of opportunity, but had, that had been ignored for quite some time. I mean, it had built out in the early 80s and not a dime had been spent out there since then. And we said, you know, and, and the communities had asked, the communities approached the University of Calgary and said, we need some help here. And so we sat down, rolled up our sleeves and spent a year in community with a whole suite of, of, of resources from the University of Calgary talking about, you know, how do we make this work? And uh, it culminated in a, in, a, in a design charrette process where the whole community came out. We had hundreds of people come through our doors and over the course of a week, we established a plan. And, then, and again, it was that two point strategy. One was the Central East Corridor strategy, the understanding that Calgary can't continue to sprawl outwards. We know that. So how does it grow up? And the argument was it grows up in thoughtful ways along corridors. Uh, supported by transit. And so that's really what the Central East Corridor strategy said. It says we've got this corridor that's really short compared to how the city sprawled from the downtown to the city of Chestermere. We've got the ability to infill it with great neighborhoods that celebrate the diversity of those communities. And we, we do so by creating a high quality transit system. And, and thus in the, you know, in 2004, 2005, 
the idea of the max transit, the max purple transit line, and the idea of that sort of bus rapid transit converting over time to LRT was born out of a community, out of community and out of the university while the city looked on saying, wow, these people are really into this kind of change. Who knew, right? Um, the other part of the strategy was the idea that International Avenue, so named in 1993 in, in, in recognition of the tremendous diversity of, of businesses from all over the world, new Canadians, you know, chain migrating to the communities of greater forest lawn, establishing businesses to serve their communities and serving the greater community. International Avenue was absolutely an international avenue. It had the highest uh, degree of pedestrian local pedestrian shopping and it was a 1960 strip that didn't even have sidewalks that that people could safely shop on i mean you it's frequently you would see uh you know mothers with strollers and bags of groceries that they had purchased from local uh, food stores you know trying to maneuver themselves on the boundary between uh you know big 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 driveways into parking lots and and grass strips and broken asphalt and it just wasn't safe, even though I mean, it was it was the it was the most pedestrian used locally pedestrian used high street in the city, and it was not designed for pedestrians. So we said International Avenue has to become an avenue worthy of that name, a great street, and and we argued that we need to make a significant public investment in turning it into a multimodal boulevard with 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 transit running down the center, uh, and and. You know, we, we won an international award from the Congress for the New Urbanism for that work. At the same time we were doing that work in and with community, the city of Calgary was fighting its own bureaucracy and fighting the communities of 16th Avenue because 16th Avenue was conceived as a road widening for the Trans-Canada Highway. And they were like, wait a minute, we're living in a different time. Maybe we have to think differently about streets. And so 16th Avenue built out as this hybrid between a road widening and a great street that was heavily contested internally and externally. And meanwhile, you know, on the east side of town, the University of Calgary and the communities have rolled up their sleeves and we're, and we're envisioning a better future, you know, collaboratively. And so at the same time we were doing that work, I was in the community of Inglewood having the very same conversation about, you know, the most historic main street in the city of Calgary, the fact that you know, this historic community that had literally built the city of Calgary and was poised to build the next Calgary had to have a very serious conversation about what growth and change looked like. You know, we had an ARP that sort of removed, we had an area redevelopment plan that had been developed through the 80s and it was developed through the 80s because the community had demanded a forward looking plan. And that, that plan very thoughtfully stripped a lot of the, uh, a lot of the challenges to redevelopment off the community. It removed road widenings for freeways that were thankfully never built in the 1960s. It acknowledged the floodplain and developed the plan to flood protect the, the community. It, it started to remove the heavy industry and get back to the mixed use neighborhood that combined industrial uses with commercial uses with, with residential uses in a very mixed use way. Uh, and it said, we need a lot more people living in this neighborhood, but it in no way said where and how those people should live. And we said, we need a plan that's developed in collaboration with the community that really talks about how many people can this big chunk of land support while protecting its valued heritage and while establishing its heritage contributions to future generations. And so I, by 2010, Emerging best practice across North America was extremely clear that we had to get away from auto centric edge growth. In 2009, the city of Calgary passed a municipal development plan that said exactly that. So the age of sprawling outwards has to end. We have to start growing up. But that municipal development plan, which was, you know, a really seminal document, and that I spoke to in front of city council wearing many hats, but prominently the, the, the president of the Inglewood Community Association. That document, like the Inglewood ARP, said what we needed to do, but it didn't say how, and it didn't say where, and it needed a lot of work. And that's what I had spent 10 years doing professionally. And so I reached the point where, where I realized that I had to, you know, and I was, I was constantly challenging the planning department. I was constantly telling them that we needed to, um, we needed to uh, uh, 
start walking the talk. Uh, you know, it, it, it's fine to talk best practices, but really as a professional planning department, it needed to actually start making the moves to make those change. And it needed to have the difficult conversations in community with people who live in those neighborhoods, with businesses that operate there. And it needed to bring the development industry that rolls up its sleeves and you know, puts private capital on the line and risks everything to try and build the city. We needed to create a collaborative approach where citizens and developers and the city were working together. And that, and again, that was work that I had done for 10 years across North America and that we were not doing in Calgary. And I realized that it wasn't gonna happen unless there was a real political push to make that happen. And so I was part of the emergence of Civic Camp, which was really the citizen group that talked about the need to, uh, to grow up and to need the need to support the municipal development plan. But I was also a critic of the fact that we had yet to figure out how to do that. We were talking about what to do, but we didn't know how to do it. And I knew how to do that. So I said, I have to either give up on Calgary because literally, my profession, I was making about 80% of my money outside of Calgary. And, 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 the, and the few professional jobs that I took in Calgary, I was always leading idealistic developers to slaughter against a city that said, this is what we want, only there's no way to get it done. And so I realized we have to get it done. We have to figure out how to overhaul the system to deeply involve community. Uh, and, and we have to do it here in this city because we have so much promise and yet we also have so many challenges. And so out of that, the Great Neighborhoods platform was born and I started knocking on doors in Ward 9. And at the time, Greater Forest Lawn was not part of Ward 9. I was knocking doors, you know, in places like Park Hill and Earlton. I was knocking doors in, across the river in Bridgeland and Renfrew. And I'm thinking, how is the average Calgarian you know, going to take me talking <laughs> like this? Uh, you know, am I going to be, I mean, I've spent 10 years working with specific communities and, and I'm fairly well known because of that, but, you know, this is a big change proposition that I'm talking about. How is it going to land at the doors? And what I found out at the doors of Ward 9 was that people chose inner city lifestyles, not for the lifestyle they were getting, but for the lifestyle that was promised and that they was within reach. And that, and then when I realized that I was the man with the plan for how to get there. And so I, uh, I was successful, you know, uh, in getting elected. My great neighborhoods platform for the last 11 years has been pursuing a five point transformation of how of best practices in city building, best practices in, in, in city organization, in terms of a city, best practices in terms of neighborhood governance and activating neighborhoods, best practices in relationships between cities and their region and, and, and the province. And, and, and the federal government. And so, you know, I'm very proud of the work that's been done. And, and I really expected that 11 years in, I would put down the political mantle and pursue uh, city building from a different angle. As I had 10 years before, 10 years, I figured, you know, maybe I'll become a developer and actually put physical buildings on the ground or something. Uh, and well, you know, I, and my I gotta, team. I got to ask the question because I want to yeah. make sure I get this in because you have been in there eleven years, and I, I, I I'm playing devil's advocate now. Yeah. You had eleven years to make Ward Nine great neighborhoods. You, you've mm -hmm. had nine, uh, eleven years to do what you've set out to do. People mm -hmm. will look at you and say, and playing devil's advocate, I'm not one mm -hmm. of these people, but will look at you and say, you've had enough time. If you haven't gotten it done now, why should we give you another term to potentially try and continue on your with your work or get it done? Yeah, and that's, that's a great question. And I think it really boils down to two things. Now, first off, I was planning, quite frankly, to, 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 to pass the torch and to move on. Um, but two things happened. Uh, number one, COVID-19 happened. And uh, COVID-19 did two things. Number one, it stopped, um, it, it, it stopped a lot of things in their tracks and it delayed a lot of things. And uh, so a lot of things that I expected to be fully over the line 11 years in and that were looking like they were getting there just are not quite there. Things like a new land use bylaw, things like, you know, really policy wonky type things. Um, things like the green line, you know, like the green line itself, you know, we, we conceptualized that 10 years ago, we put the money together six 
you know, five, six years ago. Uh, and uh, it's been a struggle to get to the announcement that we just made. And whether that announcement was just going to be made here on the other side of the election wasn't clear. And um, so the idea that city, great cities take a lot of work and city building takes a lot of time. And uh, there was more work to be done and it wasn't clear whether that work was gonna get done. Uh, and and well, the other thing of course, is that a lot of what we're talking about now is super contested. You know, I, I feel extremely lucky to have been elected in 2010 uh, under Mayor Nenshi's sort of rubric of politics and full sentences. It dovetailed perfectly with great neighborhoods, which was a, you know, a platform in full sentences. It was, you know, there's not a lot of municipal politicians that come forward with a full plan for what, for how to do what you're talking about trying to get done, you know, you know actual transformation of the civic organization. Um, so I was elected in an age of politics in full sentences. And now, like everyone else, I'm enduring an age of uh, the politics of anger, fear, and division. And a lot of the work that we've tried to achieve has been uh, you know, increasingly contested. It's an international movement that is you know, nibbling away at the fabric of democracy. I think when I opened, I said, you know, it's great that you're doing this given the fragile state that democracy is in. I really believe that Western democracy is under assault. I never intended to, you know, to be a politician. I saw myself as a city builder that was going to do some time as a politician. And now the project of politics, the project of Western democracy is under assault. And I feel, you know, almost radicalized by what I've learned in 11 years as a city councilor to defend the amazing government structures that we have here in Canada and specifically that we have here in, in Calgary because they are under assault from people who would like to tear them down and who I don't think honestly understand the repercussions of the populist flow that they sort of are trying to, you know, the parade of populism that they're trying to run out in front of and, and, and sort of seem like they're parade marshalling. So I'm I'm gonna quote your website here because I, I love I love policy talk. This is like this has been a great like literally half hour of just policy listening to you and saying okay this is great. But on your website KarafaWard9.ca, which will be linked in the show notes for my listeners and to my viewers, you say and I quote and I probably don't have to quote it to you, but to my listeners who haven't looked at your website, Calgary is now at a crossroads. This election is about Calgary choosing what kind of city it wants to become in an era of misinformation disinformation and fake news, Calgary's potential is threatened by bad actors fooling us into thinking we can return to a time in our history that never existed, end quote. I'm going to ask you two questions here. One, who are these bad actors that you're mentioning? And two, what disinformation has been out there recently that you want to clear up, that you want to say, you know what, what you're saying is a complete fabrication and is not true. This is the truth. Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, I will, I will talk generally, right? I mean, I think, you know, I, I said that I was, I was, I became a politician in an age of politics and full sentences. And now I'm enduring the age of the politics of anger, fear and division like the rest of us. I honestly think that's an international movement, right? I think that, that there are two things that are happening to Western democracy. Number one, is, is sort of the permanent campaign. It's sort of like an old age vector within, within, uh, within democracy. We used to, the Western democracy is built on the idea that we will have periodic competitions of ideas for the right to govern. And over the last 10 years on council through a series of election cycles, I've watched the permanent campaign slowly take up more and more of council's time. And the permanent campaign is the idea that instead of competing for the right to govern, we flip the script and, and the act of campaigning now uh, has usurped the act of governing, right? We govern as an act of permanent competition. And uh, you know, I would say that that is something that's happening to democracy. I think human beings like to get good at the things that they do and the competition to get elected 
has usurped the purpose of why we try and get elected. And, and now we don't make decisions of what's the right thing to do. It's what's the right thing to get elected or to, you know, to, to manipulate. And that is taking place in the context of, I think, a, a, a legitimate assault on, on Western democracy from outside forces. And, uh, you know, I would say that uh, weaponized misinformation, I, I made the mistake a couple of years ago of using the term fake news on a, on, a, on a social media tweet and the local media, you know, came at me and they're like, dude, you cannot, you know, perpetuate that trope where you're tearing down the fourth estate, you're tearing down, you know, the role that media plays. When you use the term fake news, you are basically playing into the frame of the media is not doing its job in our society. And that's a deep problem. And I was like, you're right. I cannot perpetuate the frame of fake news, but I'm not talking about nothing. So what am I talking about? And so I, I actually coined the term weaponized misinformation. And what I think weaponized misinformation is, is it is, it is psychological warfare, you know, in the, in the art and craft of Soviet propaganda style, but it's been refined by brain science and it's been supercharged by the, by social media. And when you talk about, you know, what happened with Trump getting elected in the United States, when you talk about Brexit taking place, when you talk about you know, the rise of populism, these are things that are being manipulated uh, by outside actors who are very interested, not in the project of Western democracy, but they're very interested in the project of power. And uh, I think that this is, as I said, an international project, and it has wended its way into our little corner of Western democracy here. And, and I would say that, uh, you know, my, my, my proposition to the voter is that, that we have to be very careful about how we're being manipulated. We know that the human brain has blind spots a mile wide, and we know that there are people out there who are experts in exploiting that. And here in our neck of the woods, we have actors who are, who are you know, along for that ride. Are they so victims? Gotta ask, are they I, victimized? I, I, who gotta, knows? I got to ask this question, though, yeah. because you are an elected official. You, you are mm -hmm. one of 15 people who represent the city of Calgary. Um, how mm -hmm. do you battle back misinformation when the information that's coming out is from council? And you could tweet and you could post on Facebook, but no matter what you put out there, even if it's the, the best of intentions, you will get people taking it in the wrong way. So how do you govern in a society when you can't communicate effectively because what you're going to say or what you're going to potentially do is going to be misconstrued in a way that will be used against you in a political will or avenue? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a tough question. And, and, and the basic fact is I have no idea. I have no idea how to fight this, right? You know, I, I always characterize that it gets stronger if you ignore it and it gets stronger if you fight it. And, uh, I, uh, and so all I, all I try and do is just constantly return to the first principles of what we're trying to do. I also, you know, I have to say, I, you asked me a question about why I'm running again. And I, and I talked about the sort of the fact that the work is not done. I also want to sort of go into sort of what's sort of like leading my campaign right now. And what's leading my campaign is a series of value propositions that I think are fundamental to both the city being at the crossroads that it's in and to the path that we need to take in order to be successful. So I, I, I 100 percent believe that Calgary is at a crossroads. Cities across human civilization whose core industry has collapsed or structurally changed have always sort of either faded and very infrequently they've reinvented themselves and risen on on other strengths and calgary is very much at that at that place you know we can double and triple down on oil and gas or we can recognize that that's going to continue to be a strong component of our economy but we need to build on other strengths and we need to finally diversify our economy we have to rise but we also know that the promise of Canadian pluralism that I certainly believe, I think a lot of us believe is not being realized for too many of our neighbors. Calgary, 37% of Calgarians are, are black indigenous or people, in co uh, people of color. And it is moving towards 50% very over the next you know, two decades. We are going to be 
you know, I believe that Canada is the most successful example of pluralism in the history of the world. And I honestly believe that we need to rise as a city on our strengths, but we have to rise together and that we have to acknowledge systems of, of racism. We have to acknowledge the need to become anti-racist and we have to have as a baseline for that uh, truth and reconciliation. I believe that COVID-19, sorry, you want to jump in. No, I, I because this is a topic that I've asked a lot of candidates about, and I had mm -hmm. one person come on the show and say something very stupid when they answered this question. Mm -hmm. we, we, as you just said, Calgary is becoming a more diverse community every single day. Uh, we are, I live, I live in Ward 10. It is a very diverse community, Ward 9, Ward 5, probably the most diverse areas of the city in a, in, 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 as a whole. How do we govern for everyone when we are such a pluralized community where, and I will be honest, you are the first website city council candidate who I've seen who has actively taken a moment and said, hey, I'm going to translate my website into different languages so people can understand. You do not see that that often. So how do we as a city move forward when we are so divided in our political spectrum when we're trying to bring everyone together? <laughs> That's the tough question, right? And, and I'll tell you my decision, like from a very real politics perspective, my decision to run again uh, has to do with the fact that we're at a crossroads that uh, we could go either way uh, and that the politics of Ward 9 being so gaming, Ward 9 has the lowest voter turnout of any ward in the city. And what we have is we have a tremendous number of new Canadians who are getting their feet underneath them, you know, getting their lives in Canada up and running, and they just do not have the cycles or the bandwidth or, or, or the, you know, the cultural experience to get deeply involved in politics. And the challenge is how do you reach out to those groups and, and tell them that government is for them. Uh, government is there to create a, 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 an environment for them to, su to succeed. Uh, you know, everything from policing to, you know, business licensing to, 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 to you know, and outside of the realm of, of city you know, politics, but, you know, health service, uh, education, all of these things tie in together. And how do we, how do we, how do we pull together to take care of people? Great Neighborhoods gives you the gives you sort of the example. You say, you know, you want to create communities of scale and you want to cater city resources, generic city resources, specifically to the needs of those communities by having in-depth conversations and in-depth empowering of those communities. These are the sort of, this is how you bolster democracy, where you at the grassroots level, where the rubber hits the road, where people live, give them the tools to think about what they need and put the city at their service, you know, in a very catered way. Um, we also have to sort of deeply involve ourselves in the project of listening to, you know, the, what systems exist that, that, that maintain, uh, you know, white privilege and, and figure out how to make that work. I, I feel like, you know, let me give you an example. And, and this sort of gets into the example of, you know, how do, when I talk, people, you know, take that as, you know, my best interpretation of the facts versus, you know, a weaponized misinformation that's being, you know, we had something called the guidebook for great communities for everyone be developed over the last, you know, six, seven years. And that is a direct promise of the Great Neighborhoods platform, that we would actually develop a system for planning our communities that would be you know, a, a system that you could bank on, that everybody played by, but that could be catered to the needs of every community in very specific ways and a process for catering it. And so the guidebook for great communities for everyone, you know, slowly through the political fight that emerged against it for reasons that I can't even understand, turned into the guidebook for great communities because I guess great communities for everyone was a little bit too, too value laden. And then it became the guidebook for great communities. And then it fell back to the guide for local area planning because the idea of making great communities was considered 
yeah, way too I guess <laughs> way too political, right? Um, I got a chance to stare, you know, to sit with one of my colleagues on CBC radio in the lead up to the big public hearing on the guidebook for great communities. And uh, my colleague was pushing people to go to a website that was funded by obscure, unknown third parties, uh, talking a lot of misinformation about it. And you know, my point was, or you could go to the city website where the actual facts reside. You know, like, like, I mean, it, it's it's pretty astounding, and that 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 we're sort of in this situation. So, do I go to the city government's website? that has everything that's gone on, you know, the entire process laid out if I want to learn about it, or do I go to some third party advertiser, you know, website that's against the guidebook for great communities, talking a bunch of half truths and mistruths. Like, can you imagine as a board member of the corporation of the city of Calgary, which is what a city councilor is, directing people to a website created by dark money, spouting actual mistruths, but that's the point in politics that we're in right now. So I, I, I want to talk about the future of Calgary here because we, the city is at a crossroads right now and I, I'm using your words here. We have hit, been hit by two big downturns in our economy, oil and gas leaving and COVID-19. COVID-19, no one expected this. It was not something that showed up at the, uh, like it said in 2017, hey guys, be prepared in 2020. We're going to hit you with a pandemic. It just happened. Um, yeah. The next four years are going to be critical for the future of our city. Budget, 100%. Budget 2021 is going to be the first big uh, budget that is going to be passed post quote unquote recovery, because as this goes out, as uh, our premier has said, COVID is now over. We do not have to trace, we do not have to track, but here we are. How do you envision the city working for everyone to ensure that the recovery process in the city and the people of Ward 9 all get ahead and not just a few? Because I think a lot of people are struggling right now and people want to know that that they're not going to be hurt by decisions that are made at council at the next budget process because they want to still keep their home, they want their sidewalk uh, or their roads plowed, they want their garbage picked up. So how do we ensure everyone gets ahead? Okay, uh, I, I want to. I, I really appreciate that question, and I want to talk about sort of my platform. Uh, and I and before I sort of like lay that out, I want to just sort of set the stage with a couple of things. You are right that Calgary is on the ropes. And a lot of people talk about how Calgary is on the ropes. And that's absolutely true. But Calgary also has tremendous strengths. You know, we consistently rate amongst the most livable cities in the world. We're, you know, most livable city in the Western hemisphere. Um, these are a suite of strengths that are just undeniable. And we have to understand where those strengths come from and we have to build on them. We have amongst the lowest taxes in, uh, in municipal taxes in North America for a very high level of service. And over the last six years of downturn, we've been driving the cost of government downwards. We've been increasing the cost of government below growth plus inflation. We've been taking those savings and we've been investing in things that are meaningful towards our future. Uh, these are all one-time savings though. So, you know, we do have a tremendous number of strengths and I am a huge booster and believer in Calgary. So my platform is based on three interrelated things. The first one are the value propositions that we need to commit to right now. And, and as I just talked about earlier, the first one is equity and anti-racism. We are only going to be an internationally competitive beacon of good life, of good living, if we are a place that delivers on the promise of Canadian pluralism and that, and that our success is a success for everyone. And so I am deeply committed to anti-racism. I was transformed by the, by the inquiry into systemic racism that we did last July. And we have to commit to that. And of course, the baseline of any Canadian, the foundation of any Canadian commitment to anti-racism is, is a deep commitment to truth and reconciliation. Number two, COVID-19 has taught us, if anything, that we are all in this together as a global civilization. And the next big global threat that's coming at us is climate change. Uh, and, you know, 
whether you believe in climate change or not, the entire world believes in climate change. And if we are going to differentiate ourselves as a beacon of hope in a crazy world, uh, we have to commit to climate action in very meaningful ways. And then the beautiful thing is everything that we want to do that's good uh, is a climate strategy. You know, great neighborhoods is a climate strategy. It's just time to get explicit about that and, and, and to be very clear about what we're trying to do here. The third value that I'm leading with is the idea of democracy and dialogue. Like in the face of the politics of anger, fear and division, in the face of the erosion of Western democracy that we're seeing both internally and externally, uh, we have to recognize that we have a pretty great government here and uh, we should not be electing people who don't believe in government. We should be electing people who understand the important role of government in establishing the playing field in which we succeed culturally, in which we succeed economically, in which we succeed socially and environmentally. Uh, and, and, and that has to do with like a deep relation between different orders of government, different levels of decision making. And we have to get that right. Uh, point five of Great Neighborhoods, which is a five point, really talks about a restructuring of, of, of the role of cities. So that sort of leads us to, to great neighborhoods. My five point transformation is well underway that I've been pursuing for 11 years, but it's not done yet. And that remains a baseline of best practice and it touches everything that we're doing. So great neighborhoods remains important. The final part of my platform is really future focused. We, as I said, we've spent the last six years grinding the cost of government down without significantly impacting frontline level of service. We have reached a point where we are not going to be able to cut anymore without the quality of service that we're providing to Calgarians also getting cut. And if you want to look at, you know, making ourselves internationally competitive, making ourselves the beacon of choice in a crazy world to, to come and make a great life and a great living, um, we're not going to get there. We're not gonna cut our way out of this recession. We're not gonna cut our way to prosperity. We have spent a lot, we have leaned up, now it's time to build muscle. And so what I'm calling for in the 2021 four-year budget is five dedicated funds that will start to inflect upwards and start to build the city that we need to become. The first one is the downtown recovery plan. You know, our downtown was an economic engine driving the prosperity of the entire country. And uh, it hit a structural correction. It was not based on $100 barrel oil. It was based on the real estate regime associated with $100 barrel oil, and it needs to transform. And we have a great downtown plan. It's about a billion dollars of work over the next 20 years. And right now we have $200 million of savings sitting in the bank. And we need to create a year over year fund that will get us the billion. That billion dollars, by the way, will return to us way more than a billion dollars in, in benefit, in tax base, in everything we need. So this is, this is you know, the basic business proposition that sometimes you have to spend money to make money. We need to do that for our downtown. We need to create. And what I'm calling for is like literally a line item on our tax bill. When you pay your taxes, I want people to see that a, this portion of my taxes is going to these five things. One, as I said, is the downtown recovery plan. Number two, transit-oriented development and main streets. We understand that you know, the city is not just the downtown, the city is a collection of great neighborhoods that are networked together with sustainable infrastructure systems. How do you infill a city that's been sprawling for decades into a city that grows up? You have very thoughtful conversations about where you grow up in little town centers networked by transit. I've always said that if the next million Calgarians drive as much as the current million, we're all doomed. And what a transit-oriented development and Main Street strategy allows us to do is to sensitively infill existing neighborhoods and put the density around the transit, create the opportunities there while protecting the character of the surrounding neighborhoods. So you build a population of Calgarians who live in their walkable neighborhoods, have everything that they need there. And if they have things that they don't need, 
their next stop on the line or the next stop on the line. So you start to create this network transit oriented development based on great main streets that support local communities. We have a main streets program. We have something like 24 identified main streets. And as we do local area planning with local communities, we're gonna identify more and more main streets. We need to build these main streets as great pedestrian streets, just like we did on International Avenue. That was, a, by the way, the first of the main streets. It was a $180 million uh, realization uh, of the vision that we created with the community back in 2005. We need to do that in communities across Calgary, and we need to have a fund to do that. Right now, we have $60 million of one-time savings to do that work. That'll burn out in about two, three years, and we have generations. Of, so I want a Main Street and TOD fund, and that's you know, improved public realm, but that's also the pipes under the ground to carry the services to support higher density. And these are things that these, the, all of these communities need. Number three, COVID-19 has taught Calgarians who already love their parks and recreational spaces, the importance of these things, and we need a dedicated fund. Our, I, would, I would describe our parks budget as a life support system. Our, 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 our parks are right now in a coma, and we are spending enough money to just keep, you know, keep the vital systems alive. We need to working with local communities, unleash the power of the parks. And, you know, when we, when we put love into our parks, they really sing and we just don't have enough money to do that. So we need a dedicated fund for recreation and parks. You're, you're raising your hand. I'm raising my hand because I have to ask because I, 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 I try to tune into council as much as possible, but the big mm -hmm. topic at council at the last week of July was Richmond Hill park. Mm -hmm. um, it is great that you're talking about uh, uh, it is a vital resource for everyone to use. And it goes into that misinformation that you're talking about as well. But I heard, if, and I think you did as well, you listened to the people who were concerned about Richmond Green Park being closed. And this is Ward 8. It has nothing to do with Ward 9, but I want to mm -hmm. talk about parks for a little it's bit here. It's a great second. example, though. It, it, people were saying, hey, don't close it. Do not remove this because it's great for our community, but council voted to close it down and turn it into development, but also expand into the other part, which re, uh, re uh, like take back parts of the uh, park, grow it a little bit bigger. How do you look at people and say, parks are great, but we need to also look at development as well? Well, I mean, <laughs> Richmond Green is the model for how you do it, right? So we, we heard dozens and dozens of community members saying you're destroying our park. And the reality is far, you couldn't be farther from the truth. Right now, there was about, in round numbers, there was like 20 acres of park, yep. 20 acres of golf course, and 10 acres of, of uh, city service yard. And what we were saying is we wanna take that golf course which is fenced in and available only to people who paid a fee. And it was a golf course that was struggling, a city owned golf course. And we wanted to turn it into open park. We wanted to take that 10 acres of service yard and turn it into a park. And in return, that 20 acre original chunk of park, we wanted to take five acres of that and create a little bit more development around the park to both help pay for it and also provide an, a habitat for more Calgarians to access this vastly expanded park that we were providing. And so it made dollars and cents, it made social sense. I mean, I just flat out reject the idea that more density is hurting our community. More density makes our community sing, especially when it's thoughtfully placed. And so Richmond Green is about taking sort of a leftover piece of green space and turning it into an amazing regional park. And to do so in a way that offers that amazing park to more people, more different people, and to do so and, and to offer in a way that also creates a revenue stream to help support the transformation of that park. So, you know, that I appreciate you answering no that question. And, and, and thankfully that was a no brainer for the overwhelming majority of council. And the people who did not support that were people who were very overt in their sort of populist misinformation of the, the support of the trope that we just cannot sell parks. We're not selling parks. We're massively expanding a park in a very thoughtful way, socially, environmentally, and fiscally. 
And so anyone who wants to say otherwise, um, what, what are they really getting at? The point is, uh, we're not going to be able to do that kind of trade and get a net benefit in every park in the city. And we are going to need to expand our park system. And that's why we need the line item in the budget. Uh, number four is um, accessibility, livable streets, and our A5 network. A5 network is now what we're talking, our active mobility corridors. It stands for all ages, all abilities, all the time. It's the sort of the international yeah. standard right now that the term du jour for talking about the importance of active mobility. Livable streets, I mean, I started door knocking a couple of days ago uh, for, for this campaign. And again, same as 2017, what I hear at every door is, cars are driving too fast down my street. And that's why I supported the reduction of the speed limit to 30. We have it at 40 right now. Hopefully we'll get to 30, but the only way you're gonna actually reduce traffic on the traffic speeds on neighborhood streets is to redesign them, is to make them narrower, is to make the intersections, you know, you know bulbed out and to sort of be able to, you know, put in traffic pads and, and, and speed bumps and things like that where it makes sense. We need a revenue source for that. And part of that is going to, I hope, come from speed enforcement. But part of that's also going to have to come from a dedicated tax fund. And so when you say to your city councilor, I want the traffic calm in front of my street. And when you pay your municipal taxes and you see there's a line item there. And when the city comes out and puts down the curbs and then slowly rebuilds your street so that the average driver feels safe driving 30 kilometers an hour and not faster, just on your local neighborhood streets. You know, we did reduce the speed limit to 40. I had members of council saying that we were turning the city into a parking lot. Turns out the city's functioning fine, right? You know, so many, anyway, so we need also, you know, a, a greatly expanded A5 network, a system of safe ways to walk and wheel within our communities and between our communities. I have something called the Ward 9 Dream Network, which talks about all the great ways you can get around Ward 9 on your bike or on your wheels, uh, all the ways that we are now putting in place, thanks to you know, the, the advocacy that I've been able to bring to bear for the last 10 years with local communities, and then all the things we need to add. Every neighborhood in the city, every ward, every multi-community you know, group has these needs. We need to slow traffic down. We need to make the city more accessible. And we need to create an A5 network that, that builds on our incredible pathway system. And we need a line item in our budget. The fifth thing, and maybe the most important thing in terms of budgetary uh, calls that, that I'm advocating for, is to expand the community uh, safety investment framework. So our inquiry into systemic racism made it extremely clear that 37% of Calgarians have a much different relationship with our core institutions, with our police service, with our education system, with our health system, than the white majority enjoys. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that because our emergency response to emergencies in our community defaults to the police because they are the 24-7, 365 available response team, uh, because we send the police to things that are not criminal matters, we end up criminalizing issues. And we know that, 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 that this works out problematically. If you're in mental health crisis and police with guns show up, uh, you know, sometimes uh, bad things happen. And unfortunately, bad things happen at a much higher statistical percentage with people of color than they do with white folks. And that has to change. So what we are talking about across North America, what we're talking specifically in Calgary about is that we need to greatly expand alternative service provision so that if there is a mental health crisis at four in the morning, uh, in, you know, in the middle of May, uh, we can deploy people who are mental health professionals and not police. If we have homeless related issues that we can tie that into our housing system and if we have you know, uh, addictions related issues that we can send medical professionals and not just police all the time. Sometimes it has to be police and, and the medical professional. Sometimes the medical professional alone is all we need. 
but we need to develop a next generation emergency response system that's tied into you know, a much broader prevention system. And this is a commitment that is being made across North America and Calgary's in a position to deliver on in a leading way. Um, the police chief, Mark Newfeld, has said, you know, it's unclear whether we have enough resources and we're just not coordinating them well, whether we need to redeploy how the police do their work within the police budget or whether we need to create another budget line item, maybe some from policing, some from other sources to create alternative response model. My answer is we're probably gonna to have to end up doing all three. The community safety investment framework is the fund and the workspace, the collaborative workspace between multiple agencies and groups, Alberta Health, the police, the city of Calgary, where this work takes place and, and the not-for-profit sector. And we need to greatly expand the ability to do that transformative work in the years ahead with oversight from uh, you know, not only council, but the Social Wellbeing Advisory Committee and the Anti-Racism Action Committee and, and our indigenous relations. So you know, those are the five transformative investments in our future tied to the value proposition, tied to the ongoing transformative work of great neighborhoods. And because all of those things are underway and because it touches things from like flood protection upstream or regional work, I have, I've been working on this stuff for 11 years. And when I look at the amount of turnover we're going to have on council, we have guaranteed 11 new faces on council at this critical moment. Uh, and we also have a very difficult electoral calculus in Ward 9 for all of those reasons. I decided, and my team told me that I could not put my hat down, and I had to break it to my wife that I uh, no, in fact, I was <laughs> going to seek another four years uh, of, of public service. I love this city. I'm committed to it. I believe that we have a great future, and okay. uh, I, I'm not going to let 11 years uh, slip when this is the moment when we need to rise and rise together, and I have a role to play. I'm just cautious of time here. I have one last question before we start our wrap up. Um, you have talked extensively about uh, racism and the anti-racism that the city went through. You you just threw out a figure that I want to ask, and it's going to be a loaded question, and I apologize for that. But you said 37% no. of people feel like uh, they don't they they are targeted or potentially looked at or don't feel like they can access adequate uh, services here in the city, whether it be through the police or education. Do you believe the city is a racist or a racist city, or do you believe that there's an institutional racism problem within the city of Calgary? Well, well I, I, along with the all of council, sorry, no worries, along, along with all of council, I acknowledged after our, so let, let, let me just, let me just give you a little bit of background. COVID-19 forced us all inside and what COVID-19 taught us also is that um, different groups in our society experienced COVID-19 very differently. And some of us were fine and, and some of us were all of a sudden very not fine and did not have uh, the social support network to, to, to ind endure. I think because of that, the murder of George Floyd on the street of, uh, you know, on, on the tarmac of the street in Minneapolis was lit a spark and people exploded out into the streets across the world, acknowledging both that Black Lives Matter and that we've got a problem. And that happened here in the city of Calgary. We had huge Black Lives Matter protests in the city of Calgary. And what the protesters very clearly stated was that their city government needed to observe what was happening in the streets and then invite that conversation into the halls of our city government. I am the chair of Community and Protective Services. That is my job to sort of oversee all of those frontline services or to provide you know, chairmanship direction with my colleagues uh, of all of those frontline city services. And so it really defaulted uh, to me to figure out how to make that happen. And we of course wanted to do it in a good way, but we also wanted to act quickly. And uh, we last July 
invited the community to come in to talk to us about systemic racism. I seated the chair and became co-chair with Dr. Melinda Smith, who was the inaugural um, uh, vice provo of EDI at the University of Calgary. She had just moved down to Calgary. And so she had an outsider's perspective. She's an expert on systemic racism. We invited uh, experts from across the BIPOC community, uh, leaders in the BIPOC community to join us for the first half day. And they all presented you know, the perspective on systemic racism from their leadership positions within their communities. And then we opened up the floor. For the next three days, we heard from about 160 Calgarians, BIPOC Calgarians, their experiences with systemic racism. And what became very clear to myself and council who spent our three days you know, attached to our screens, participating, listening, was that it doesn't matter what the age of, the, of, of our neighbor, it doesn't matter what their particular ethnocultural background was, it doesn't matter what their socioeconomic status, rich and poor, it doesn't matter what their education level was, it doesn't matter what their newness to Canada was, they could be recent immigrant or they could be a second or third generation Canadian. Our BIPOC neighbors, 37% of Calgarians experience a different relationship with our institutions than the rest of us. And these are systems of oppression that are deeply baked into our culture and to our, into our institutional life. As an academic policy wonky type person, I understood systemic racism. I took some pleasure in thinking that Calgary was a little bit better than other places. You know, I understood that when we did an inquiry into systemic racism, I would experience things in a more real way than, you know, the, the dispassionate third person sort of academic -y way I understood it. Uh, but let me tell you, the gap between theory and practice that was crossed for me and for all of my colleagues on council was significant. And at the end of that hearing, we declared and acknowledged that Calgary has a systemic racism problem and that our job as leaders, our job as a city government, our job as a people is to make good on the promise of Canadian pluralism and make sure that the institutions that we enjoy, that serve us, serve us all in an equitable way. And so, you know, that was a game changer for me. And, uh, you know, is Calgary racist? What I know is that it's systemically racist. And I know now that the people who enjoy, I mean, so what I say is that there are three kinds of Calgarians right now. There are Calgarians who have woken up and who recognize, you know, that we have a systemic racism problem. And, you know, some of them, you know, obviously our BIPOC neighbors are much more aware of it than, than the white majority who are cloaked in our privilege. But there are those who recognize that we have a problem and understanding that are committed to fixing it. I would say the second group, the overwhelming majority of the white population doesn't quite understand that yet. They have not had three days of inquiry into systemic racism. They do not know people of color well enough. They are you know, living in their bubbles and, and, it, and, and they might, appreciate the dream of Canadian pluralism. They might sort of ascribe to it, but they do not have, you know, a day-to-day -day working understanding of, of where the problems are and, and do not have an urgent need to fix it. Like someone like myself, who, who, who has made that commitment. And we have to bring those people along and we have to, uh, we have to get them committed. And, and, you know, and, and that's a delicate conversation. You got to talk about it. You got to act on it. But the third group is the problem. And these are the people who, whether they understand it or not, are committed to not fixing it. They're committed. And, and what we're seeing is the rise of overt racism in direct response to a challenge to their privilege. And, you know, when I talk to BIPOC communities 
when I, I mean, I attended a, a, a uh, rally a, a couple of weeks ago on the steps of City Hall uh, against uh, Islamophobia and, and a vigil in support of the, of the family in Ontario who was mowed down by a guy in a car because they had the audacity uh, to, to walk around their neighborhood in, in hijabs. Um, I, I suggested that as dark and as horrible as this rise of overt racism is, it's an indication that things are changing. And if I want to extend that, that to this election, I think that that's one of the things, one of the very important things that's at stake in this, relation, in, in this election. This is the election where we acknowledge that we need to make meaningful change. We need to rise and rise together. Or this is the election where we um, pursue a status quo and oftentimes the status quo as per the, the verbiage on my website that, that, that hearkens nostalgically to a past that never really existed, an idealized past. And that, you know, that's a classic trope of, of populism and fascism to, to sort of play on your fears and evoke a better time that you know, maybe never existed because change is, is, is scary. But I also think change is hopeful and I'm excited to offer my ongoing services to help transform our city in all the ways that I think we need to transform to become our best selves. My last question for you, John Carlo, because I'm just yet again cautious of time here, but how can people learn more? How can people learn more about yourself, get involved in the campaign, reach out? What are the avenues that you're available to communicate with people? Well, a, a number of things. First off, if you want to have a direct conversation with me, just jump on Twitter. I still crazy. I, I still like Twitter because there are still good conversations that can happen there. All of my, so I've got great people helping me with social media. But when you talk to me on Twitter, you're talking directly to me. Come at me and let's chat. Number two, uh, my campaign realized that we're talking about big, heady things and uh, that we need to, the stories that we tell ourselves define who we are and who we want to be. And so my campaign is doing a series of conversations with Kara about a lot of these big, important topics. Uh, and so I encourage you to participate. Actually, uh, uh, just tonight, I mean, I know this is going to air in September, but you know, we're in the middle of, we're in the beginning of August tonight. I'm having a conversation uh, with the traditional knowledge keeper that's on my campaign team, Wendy Walker, and uh, Chief Lee Crowchild of the Tutsina Nation to talk about indigenous people and how uh, settlers can, can best commit to truth and reconciliation. We're doing a bunch of really interesting conversations. We just did a, an incredible piece on, on gender equity and diversity with some, some feminist leaders in the city. So, you know, there are a ton of resources out there and I'm doing my best to sort of have these conversations as they pertain to Calgary and to Ward 9 and to East Calgary. We're doing three town halls in, in, in September. Uh, and I think, you know, hopefully we'll be able to actually have physical town halls on top of digital town halls. But who knows as the fourth wave rises, um, or maybe we won't even know there's a fourth wave because we're no longer tracking any of that. Um, but we're going to talk about the values of anti-racism in one town hall. We're going to talk about, you know, climate action. And we're going to talk about democracy and dialogue in three major uh, town halls. Uh, and, and then the final thing is, you know, we're not only knocking doors for my campaign, but we're, we're doing uh, community events. On July 1st, we held an indigenous concert uh, and all wore orange and a couple hundred people came out and it was really special. Uh, we're rolling out my campaign through the month of August uh, with, with walk and wheel parades through the neighborhood streets of Ward 9. 10 to noon, we roll up after pulling a band and handing out frozen treats along the, along the neighborhood streets to a beloved neighborhood park for a concert and a barbecue. So we can actually you know, hang out together and see each other eye to eye. We're serving, you know, in Aaron Woods, we're serving Vietnamese food. Uh, in Inglewood and Ramsey, we're ending up at, at Sweetgrass Lodge and we're, and we're serving Bannock tacos at Elbow River Camp. You know, we're, we're, we're really trying to celebrate 
the diversity of Ward 9 in community and making it available for people to plug in and to participate. And, uh, you know, I think, I hope that love and hope will conquer hatred and fear every time. But I know that hatred and fear and division are, are really immediate reactions. And so as Calgarians move towards this most critical election in our city's history, as we face a very exciting, but also very, you know, scary, massive turnover in our leadership. I want everybody, you know, regardless of your political strike to really think deeply about the story you're telling yourself about who you are, who your community is, who our city is, and most importantly, who do we want to be? And have that hopeful conversation with our best future really drive what motivates you at the ballot box. I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, to my viewers and to my listeners, the links to Giancarlo Corra's uh, website, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, uh, Twitter will be in the show notes. Please get out. Please get educated because this is uh, the future of our city that we're talking about. Get out and vote. October 18th is our election. Giancarlo, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. No, I greatly appreciate the work that you're doing. I think podcasts are an amazing way to do a deep dive into the issues that really matter. And, you know, it's all about local journalism like this. So thank you for what you're doing. It's a tremendous contribution to our city. And I'm happy and honored to be able to participate.